Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. The sly grin of the pale face shone in the moonlight. The man held out his thumb on the side of the road, a thumb that seemed unnaturally long and pointed. His skin looked as white as a sheet of paper and his grin spread from ear to ear. His eyes watched me passing like two dark oil spots shining under the street lamp. I did not pull over. I didn't even talk to the man. But it would happen again. Everything had gone strange. That day back in 2019 had seemed normal enough. I had gone to work, doing a night shift at the warehouse. They paid me decent, $24 an hour, so commuting 30 minutes each way didn't bother me. I certainly had no higher paying warehouse jobs in my town a town where huge stretches of forest took over most of the land. At 2.25 a.m. I left work, driving home the same country roads I had used thousands of times before. It was a straight shot to my town, a winding paved road that passed by countless corn and tobacco fields, the smell of manure permeating the air and wafting in through the vents. I had burned the air freshener slightly, as I always did, releasing a nice vanilla smell inside the car that sent the reeking odor of old fertilizer away. But by 2.50 a.m., I realized something seemed off. First, I should have reached houses by now, but the road just kept going forwards, totally dark, the fields stretching off to the horizon in every direction. Eventually, I realized I was going in a circle. I saw the same massive dead tree on the right, its bare branches reaching up into the cloudless sky. I considered turning around and trying to go back the way I came, but I knew I had to be on the right road. So I kept going forwards, and after a few minutes, I saw the hitchhiker for the first time. His skin looked totally white and bloodless, thin and papery as it stretched across his strangely inhuman face. His grin seemed to stretch from ear to ear, and I saw his long, twisted thumb extended when I passed. Like hell I'm picking him up. I said to myself, turning on the radio. But I checked the rearview mirror a few times, my heart seeming to beat too fast in my chest when I did, and I saw him staring in my direction, still smiling broadly. His limbs seemed thin and twisted, too long, the joints bending in ways and areas that a human limb shouldn't normally go. He wore a plain khaki shirt and khaki pants. I didn't realize it at the time, but that was the uniform for jails and prisons in the area at least for lower security inmates who didn't require the bright red or orange jumpsuits of potential escapees or those suspected or convicted of extreme crimes. The streetlights flickered as I looked back, strobing quickly, casting the silhouette of the man in an eerie light. With every strobe, I saw his face transforming, the smile fading into a scowl of pure hatred and insanity. I drove faster, trying to get away. Five minutes later, I saw him again in front of my car, the road went straight, but somehow he had gotten ahead of me again. The lights flickered faster all around the road, and his smile had returned, though looking even more menacing than before. His teeth looked too sharp, and there seemed to be far too many of them in that inhumanly wide mouth. As I drove slowly past him, my heart hammering in my chest, the whole world went dark, and I slammed on my brakes. The lights on my car had just cut out as well as the streetlights, and the ambient light from the stars and moon was non-existent under the thick black clouds covering the sky to the horizon. I heard light footsteps against the pavement of the road. My engine still ran, but even inside the car, the lights had gone out. The radio turned off and the gauges stopped working. Something felt wrong inside the car and not just in the mechanical sense. There was a feeling of dread as the street lights and gauges and radio all came back on at the same moment. I saw the man in my passenger seat, that eerie grin still spread across his face. The door had never opened or shut as far as I knew or heard. It seemed like he had just teleported into the car from his position near the passenger door. But perhaps that was simply a trick of my mind and the darkness. Perhaps. Thank you for helping me, he said in a low, mocking tone. You don't know how many people just drive past and refuse to help their fellow human beings in a time of trouble. What do you want? I asked in a low voice, whispering the words. I wished I had a knife or a can of mace or something that would give me an edge. I felt naked. I just need a ride to the next exit, my friend, he said. 
This isn't a highway, I said. There are no exits. It's just a random country road, and I'm not even sure I know where I am. I don't know how that's possible, seeing as I take this way home every day, but... There are exits when we need them in life, he said, and I need one now. Go forwards, and when you see the exit to Rusty Township, take it. I'll let you go if you do. I'll let you live. But otherwise... He turned to me, grinning again. Looking at his sly and human face, hearing his words, a fragment of an old poem by Robert Browning. I first heard in college came to me. My first thought was he lied in every word, that hoary cripple with malicious eye. Askance to watch the working of his lie, on mine and mouth scarce able to afford. Suppression of the glee that pursed and scored, its edge at one more victim gained thereby. What else should he be set for with his staff? What save to waylay with his lies and snare? All travelers who might find him posted there and, and ask the road? I guessed what skull-like laugh. Would break, what crutch gin write my epitaph, for pastime in the dusty thoroughfare. Looking into those eyes, I felt that this poem had been written about this exact man. I drove forwards and the man reached into his pocket. I tensed, expecting a knife or a gun, but he brought out a little pouch. What's that? I asked nervously, looking over. To my surprise, an exit sign had shown up a few hundred feet ahead. The pale man threw the pouch from hand to hand, his twisted, inhumanly long fingers snatching it out of the air like a toad snatching a fly. Just a few precious things I like to keep on me, he said. Where we are going, we will need these. By the way, what is your name? If we are going to be traveling companions, we should introduce ourselves. That is, after all, the basic custom in all worlds. Up ahead I could make out the sign now. To Rusty Township, five miles. Ah, good old Rusty, the man said. It is a spectacular place. You will never see another one like it, I guarantee you. By the way, my name is Foras. I'm quite a big deal where I come from, you see. You'll be happy you stopped and helped me, I guarantee that. He laughed, a shrill, gurgling sound that made my blood run cold. Isn't that right, Jason? I nodded. I wasn't surprised in the least that he knew my name already. Clearly, he had been waiting for me and me alone. I didn't know why, but I had a feeling I would find out soon. I turned on my blinker as we approached the exit, even though I hadn't seen another car or human being on the road in over an hour and a half. The woods rapidly receded into broken, bombed-out houses and buildings. The darkness around us jumped and danced as the headlights illuminated rusting tanks with the tops blown off and burnt cars whose blackened skeletons stood on the sides of the roads like sentries, their smashed and shattered safety glass scattered across the road. What is this place? I asked, horrified. Just keep driving, the man said. At certain points, the road narrowed so much from the wreckage that I had to slow down to a few miles an hour, trying to weave in and out of the cataclysmic damage that had destroyed this city. Off in the distance, I saw the silhouettes of skyscrapers, black against a dark gray, cloudy sky. No lights shone in the buildings. Bodies hung from the dead, lightless lampposts as we neared the downtown. Soon, the entire main street turned into a pile of wreckage, and my car could go no further on that road. The remains of what looked like a fighter jet shone under my headlights, pieces scattered and twisted and blackened from flames across every part of the road. The corpse of the plane mixed with the various burnt-out cars and destroyed tanks to create a nearly impenetrable barricade, unless one was on foot and could climb over the wreckage. Foras pointed to a side street, grinning. I swung the car left, and the lights illuminated a horror I had never imagined, the first living being I had seen in this apocalyptic wasteland. I thought I saw a little boy for a moment, but it seemed all wrong. His skin shone a bright red like the color of inflammation, and he spider-walked all fours backwards, his head upside down, his hands twisted in front of him as his chest bent and heaved. I had never seen anything like it, except maybe in movies like The Exorcist, and the speed with which he went forwards in that twisted posture sent waves of dread running through my body. His eyes focused on the headlights of the car, and he hissed so lewdly that I could hear it through the closed windows of the car. He moved forward, twisting and writhing, his joints seeming to bend in ways that no human limb could, his head so hyperextended that it looked like his neck should have snapped. 
but it was the eyes. The eyes reflecting the light of the headlamps that really disturbed me. They looked to be covered in a bloody film, a thick pink membrane that dribbled strange fluids down his face. Underneath that cataract, I could almost see the vague suggestion of eyes, but it was like staring down a well, unable to make out the bottom except by silhouettes or glimpses. Jumping up on all fours, he flew through the air and landed fast on my windshield. I began to scream. Forrest, do something, I yelled, but his bloodless, inhuman face seemed nonplussed. I saw, in the photographic awareness of a massive adrenaline spike, he still had his little pouch in his hand. Sighing, he opened it up, untying the drawstring. I heard little clicking sounds coming from inside. Looking back up, I saw the boy's face almost pressed against the windshield, staring directly at me. The eyes only a foot away through the thin glass regarded me with abject hatred and hunger. He gnashed his teeth, snapping his jaw open and closed. Then I saw his little red hand lift up and he started smashing at the windshield. With no apparent pain, his fist collided with the glass in front of my face. A circular dent appeared, the loud thud making me jump so high I nearly hit my head on the top of the car. Cracks spiderwebbed out. He raised his hand again, punching hard, furious, spitting and hissing. Coming back down, I heard the windshield give way when he hit the same exact spot again. As if in slow motion, I saw the web of cracks lengthen and thicken when the safety glass shattered, sending the debris flying all over me, Forrest in the inside of the car. Forrest no longer smiled. His scowl made him look totally demented. The pouch had opened, and from it, he drew a pebble, no larger than a pencil eraser. The pebble seemed to radiate colors and light, almost like opal, but the light in this stone seemed to come from within it. The rainbows of colors shimmered within the stone, constantly swirling and combining. The boy began to reach into the car and I started shrieking. His fingers looked broken and twisted, and I saw his nails had turned black, with crusted blued and dirt shoved deep underneath them. The smell of his body from so close made me want to gag. The odor felt like it had a physical presence in the car, a thick, rotting, cheesy smell that emanated from the boy's strength flesh. Forrest grabbed the hand just as it neared my throat. The bleached hand of Forrest snatched it in a blur, moving faster than humanly possible, and with a terrible crack, I heard the bone snap as he twisted the hand backwards until it nearly touched the boy's arm. The bone splintered and snapped through the skin, sending drops of dark crimson blood flying in every direction. After a moment of utter silence, the boy let out a wail that shook the car. I covered my ears as the rest of the glass in my car shattered under the deafening cacophony. God, shut him up! I tried to scream to Forrest, but I couldn't even hear my own words. If it went on much longer, I felt certain my eardrums would explode. I clamped down tighter around my ears, but at that moment, Forrest pulled the boy by his broken arm towards him and raised the colorful stone to the boy's face. With his other hand, he grabbed the boy's throat and choked, closing off his windpipe. My ears rang in the sudden silence. My boy, my boy, Forrest said in a fatherly tone, smiling. This is the wrong car for you to attack. He squeezed tighter, and the boy's already crimson face went an even darker hue. He tried to claw and bite at Forrest but the boy rapidly lost strength. As the boy died, Forrest raised the string, iridescent pebble to the boy's mouth. I saw something go from the boy into the pebble, but I'm not sure what. It looked like streaming shadows, totally black and impenetrable. It ran in a current, the black torrent swirling and twisting as the pebble absorbed all of it. The boy seemed to lose substance, his skin sucking in on his body, his flesh evaporating before my eyes. By the end, he looked like just a desiccated skeleton with dried, papery skin. Forrest threw him forwards easily, the light body arcing through the air and falling on top of a blackened motorcycle laying on its side in the middle of the street. I looked over and saw with both wonder and horror that the pebble had changed. Its formerly opalescent quality had gone, and now torrents of black and dark crimson swarmed in the stone, still twisting and moving constantly, but without the beautiful iridescent light it had earlier shown. What? What is this place? I asked, the only thing I could think of. I didn't expect Forrest to answer truthfully. I knew he would probably kill me as soon as we got to wherever we were going. 
but he surprised me and told me a story that I would later confirm to be true. I told you this is Rusty Township, he said, in the country of Victoria. It is a rather long story, I am sorry to say, and I don't have time to tell you all of it. I can give you, what do you call it in your world, the Cliff Notes version. Okay, I said uncertainly. He looked down at the pebble, still in his hand, and with a dexterous flip of his fingers, threw it in the air and watched it land perfectly in the little open pouch in his other hand. He tied the knot and put it back in his pocket, turning to me and grinning. It is a rather funny story, he said. I mean at least to me. A few billion dead, and the rest refugees in a dying, unrecognizable world. He laughed at this. I guess it all started with a man called General Matheson. He took power in Victoria in a coup from the democratically elected government during a period of hyperinflation and crippling unemployment when the people rioted and the homeless covered every street. The citizens of Victoria supported him, by and large, because the conditions seemed so terrible that they thought it couldn't possibly get any worse. Ironic in a way, isn't it? So General Matheson started fixing the economy by starting wars. A wartime economy required countless tanks, soldiers, planes, missiles, and everything else, which caused new jobs to appear. He bombed the Kingdom of China, stating that they had taken legitimate islands in the South China Sea from Victoria's ally in the region. Meanwhile, back at home, he also began recruiting men for the running of camps and the rounding up and murder of all undesirables. He began with drug addicts and alcoholics, homeless people, the insane, criminals and whoever else seemed unfit for his great new country. The men called themselves the Iron Servants. They would drag people off the streets and take them away, never to be seen again. In reality, the Iron Servants would put them in a cell or transport bus and give them all water to drink, water laced with high doses of carfentanil and atorphine, which are both tasteless and extremely lethal. Afterwards, they'd just burn the bodies in open air pits. By this method, they killed tens of millions of people and the economy was absolutely roaring. Everyone was happy, everyone had jobs, and all the problems seemed to have disappeared overnight. A true success, right? A happy ending. Well, not exactly. It turns out the Kingdom of China had developed a strange new bomb. Not a nuclear one, but one that used antimatter as the explosive material. It had a far stronger yield than any hydrogen bomb ever developed, or so they predicted. But antimatter was so expensive and hard to produce that they had no trial runs. They took the first bomb and dropped it over Victoria's center, near the city of Rusty Township, where we are now. The antimatter ignited when it hit the surface and was released from its containment, and there was an explosion, a massive crater that went deep into the ground. A black mushroom cloud went high into the clouds, and the ground shook. But when the smoke had cleared, it seemed the antimatter bomb hadn't had nearly as much yield as projected. Most of the city still stood, but that crater. That crater had strange things within it, as the people soon found out. Very strange things indeed. They began to crawl and swarm out of the hole, as if a tunnel to another world had been opened. And perhaps it had. There's no perhaps about it, I thought to myself, as I put the destroyed car in drive and went forwards into a dead city. Desperate, I watched Forrest out of the corner of my eye. He seemed to watch me in return, though his eyes constantly flicked back to the road. I saw the headlights reflecting off strange eyes in the alleyways and buildings, but whenever I turned to look, only the shadows remained. I had my seatbelt on and Forrest didn't. He must have felt confident in his abilities and unconcerned with a car crash. I knew he had power, and I quickly formulated a suicidal plan. I accelerated the car. Ahead of us, I saw a light pole with a long, dead, desiccated corpse hanging from a fraying noose. I tried to line up the passenger side of the car directly with the metal pole. Holding my breath, I closed my ease as the car closed the last few feet still accelerating engine roaring. I couldn't have been going more than 40 miles an hour but it sent Forrest flying through the shattered windshield. The driver's side airbag deployed, smashing me in the face so hard I saw stars. I felt blood gushing from my nose, and the world seemed to go dark for a few seconds. The engine hissed, 
spitting coolant and transmission fluid and great steaming gouts that puddled under the car. After regaining my senses, I looked up to see Forrest. He lay on the hood of the car, moaning and moving his hands in random circles. Blood streamed from a deep gash on his skull and covered his inhuman face. He wasn't smiling anymore. Stumbling, my fingers trembling, I undid the seatbelt and opened the driver's door, falling on the cracked pavement below. I breathed hard, then with a sudden burst of will, I pushed myself up. Fora still grunted incomprehensible sounds, apparently unaware of where he was. I heard him repeating the same nonsense over and over. Anung, anung, ah, oo, ma, he said, clenching and unclenching his twisted fingers. I thought of just choking him then and there, while he was seemingly weak and defenseless. But I didn't know how defenseless he actually was, even in this weakened state. Moreover, I had no idea how to get back to my world, and killing the only being who I felt sure knew the way might backfire spectacularly, dooming me here for the rest of my life. I decided to book it as fast as I could and leave him there, bleeding on the crumpled front of the car. I started walking fast, stumbling slightly as a sharp pain ran up my leg. When I felt I had mostly regained my balance after the crash, I started jogging away. Looking back towards the car, I saw him getting up slowly, trying to push himself off the hood of the car with his long, strange fingers. He fell back down on the hood, then reached down with shaking hands and took something out of one of his bound leather satchels, placing it in his mouth. I took a left into the first alleyway I found. This whole city was a horror show, a deluge of nightmares. Rotting corpses lay everywhere, and I saw a dumpster at the end of the alleyway, filled to the brim with body parts. Decomposing legs, arms, chests, and hands all sliced off had been thrown into the dumpster haphazardly, like common refuse. One hand limply reached out as if trying to motion for help. It had blackened fingernails, and the thumb was missing. The body parts overflowed the dumpster, a cloud of bugs buzzing around it. The smell, as I got near, was overwhelming. I gagged, moving to the other side of the alley, trying to put as much distance between myself and that dumpster as humanly possible. It was an odor like rotting tomatoes, mixed with feces and rancid meat. But before I left that city, I would see and smell much more like it. I took random turns left and right through the streets and alleyways, trying to put as much distance as possible between myself and Forrest. Paranoid, I kept hearing imaginary footsteps, but it was always just the echo of my own. In one alleyway, I saw what looked like a mutated raccoon standing at the far end. It was the size of a German shepherd, with huge tumors and fibroid growths all over its body. I saw a fifth paw hanging down underneath its stomach, boneless and stunted. It gnawed on the corpse of an old woman that had long since desiccated, chewing open her bones and trying to suck out the marrow with its twisted stained teeth. The raccoon didn't notice me, or the strange silhouette slowly sneaking up behind it. As soon as I saw movement, I quickly looked around and saw a stainless steel garbage can with dark, thick fluid that dripped down the exterior. When I hurriedly peered down, part of me expecting to see Forrest's inhuman, grinning face in there, I found something nearly as horrible. I saw the garbage can was filled with rotting dogs and cats, piled one on top of another like cordwood. For a moment I was so horrified that I almost forgot what I was doing. Then my brain screamed at me to move, to hide, and I lunged to the side, hoping the man on the far end of the alleyway hadn't seen me. I held my breath, trying not to inhale the overwhelmingly rancid stench that radiated from the can. Decomposing animals smell different from rotting human corpses, as anyone with experience in both can attest to. Rotting corpses always had more of a rotten tomato smell, combined with a sewage smell, compared to the musky odor that mixed in with the putrefying meat of a dead animal. Both were absolutely horrible, some of the worst smells I had ever experienced. At first, I thought it was some sort of deformed monster, with irregular growths and fibroid tissue standing out all over its body. Then I saw it was just a man, some sort of mutant or victim of a genetic disorder or radioactivity. Or maybe something even worse, he had a bat with nails sticking out of it, and before the mutated raccoon could turn its head, he had whipped the far end of the bat into the top of its skull. 
The raccoon crumbled to the ground with a soft exhalation of air. My first instinct was to run, but something in the man's demeanor made me think he wasn't the monster I at first believed. He walked in a childish way and talked to himself. I could hear the sad words he muttered in a low voice, echoing off the brick walls of the alleyway. More raccoon, he said. I'm so sick of eating raccoon alone every night. I wish I could find some more jerky. Remember when we found that big stash of beef jerky in the bunker? I shouldn't have eaten it all so fast. Dumb Frankie never thinking about the future. He whacked himself hard on the side of his deformed head. Hello, I called out, overriding my better judgment. I had few options, trapped in this strange dead city in another world. The man, who had just started dragging the raccoon corpse away by the scruff of its neck, immediately froze, his face a comical mask of confusion. He didn't seem scared at all, but now he noticed me for the first time as I stepped out from behind the garbage can. He looked me up and down. What's a normie like you doing in the city? He asked. I saw one eye had a slanting look, like a fold of skin had partially grown over his eyelid. The other widened comically in surprise as he saw my clothes. You look like the ones who come through the stairway never turns out good, I'll tell you. They don't know what they're doing, coming down those stairs. He dropped the raccoon's body and quickly strode over to me, moving much faster than his size would suggest. He put out his huge, scarred hand. I stared at it for a moment, confused. Then I reached out and shook it. I felt his iron grip crush the bones in my hand and tried not to wince. I looked at him closer and realized he looked similar to the Elephant Man, except far more solidly built and mobile. He had the same strange growths emerging from his face and body, however. They didn't hide the bulging muscles underneath. I'm Frankie, he said, smiling, showing his few remaining teeth. I used to live here with my family. He motioned to the destroyed ruins of the city around us. But after the bomb, my mama, she disappeared. I miss her so much. I keep looking, hoping I'll see her again, but I don't think she's here anymore. I think I'm all alone now. He looked like he was about to cry. I had no idea what to say. I'm Jason, I said. I'm sorry about your mother, Frankie. Do you know your way around this place? His sad expression evaporated, and he smiled again, the corners of his mouth forming a partial smile, which seemed as far as he could move them. It made me feel sad to watch him. He had a sense of innocence and friendliness that contrasted heavily with the hellish conditions surrounding him. He seemed like he was mentally somewhat slow, but he also had a sense of confidence in his ability to survive in this apocalyptic wasteland, which I admired. Of course. Didn't I say I grew up here? There's a building near here, very strange though. It changes often. The passageways move around. The doors switch places, and it leads down, very deep. I don't go down to the bottom. He shuddered. It's filled with horrible things. I was about to respond when I heard a strange humming noise. It sounded ethereal, almost like a gong or a singing bowl, and yet the sound also seemed to get into my bones and made my eyes water. Even now, a few years later, my eyes water just thinking about it. It was one of the most jarring and horrendous sounds I've ever heard. Frankie's eyes widened in horror. He dropped the raccoon and grabbed me by the arm. He ran towards the street. As soon as we came out on the street, my breath caught in my throat. One of the largest buildings I had ever seen stood there, the color of polished silver. I saw windows spiraling around the exterior of it, like the stairs on a lighthouse. Looking up, I couldn't even see the top of it. It seemed to simply fade into the dirty gray clouds above our heads. No time to look now, Frankie whispered, a tone of urgency in his voice. Come on. He pulled me forward to the other side of the huge street, across twelve lanes of cracked concrete and rubble. He ran into the shattered glass doors of the massive skyscraper. I heard shards of glass and rusted nails cracking underneath my steel-toed shoes, and I was glad I had come from work and hadn't been wearing sandals. That humming seemed more insistent, higher pitched and closer. I turned to look quickly, and I saw Forrest coming out of the alleyway, a look of fury and hatred twisting his bleached white face. His eyes blazed, 
and he kept snapping his head to the left and right, almost certainly looking for me. As he got closer, the humming grew louder, and I saw him holding the same pebble he had held to the demonic boy's face as he had died. Thou tiny, it gave off a strange black light that threw twisting shadows over the rubble and ruined buildings outside. I realized, with horror, that he was using it as some sort of tracking device to find me and very likely kill me. He still had dried blood staining his face, and I saw fresh drops running down his scalp. He ignored them and, like a bloodhound berserk, with the scent of its prey, moved forwards towards me. You need to hide, Frankie said urgently, and he pointed at the corner of the lobby. I saw a hatchway sitting open. The bunker. Let's go. Without any more urging, I sprinted towards it. Frankie went down first and I followed. As I poked my head out, reaching up to grab the hatch, I saw Forrest only feet from the shattered glass doors of the skyscraper. As quietly as possible, I lowered it, pulling out my phone to shine some light, and I turned the steel wheel locking us inside. I used the light to catch up with Frankie, who seemed to know the tunnels so well that he could navigate them in the dark. He turned his deformed face towards me, smiling and excited, a childish glee evident from his expression. He won't be getting through that, Frankie said. That's a bomb door. It was built for the big ones, the H-bomb and the antimatter one. What is this place? I asked. They call it Sanctuary, he said. There's an entire underground town in here. This is where General Matheson used to run his government from. It goes up 200 stories. How do they build it so big? I shook my head. I don't know, I said. So do people live down here? He frowned at the question, thinking for a long moment. Then his eyes widened. People? He asked. No, no people. Okay, I said, no people, so what does that mean? Well, he said, other things do like to live down here. It's a big place, you know. Even I haven't explored most of it, but sometimes the pigmen get in here, and the snakes. I usually run when the snakes get in here. He shuddered. What kind of snakes, I asked. Like, rattlesnakes? His expression stayed stoic for a long moment as he considered the question. Then he began to laugh, a sound like a child amused by a dirty joke. You mean those little ones with the rattle on their tail in the deserts, he said, still chuckling. No, no. I mean snakes, usually about my height, and as long as... He pointed down to the end of the tunnel, a few hundred feet away. I groaned. Some people also think General Matheson lives under sanctuary, he said. But the tunnels further down run for hundreds of lengths, you know. I didn't know what a length was, but when he explained in his slow, plodding way... I figured out it meant about half a mile, or so I guessed anyway. Why would General Matheson live down here? I said, genuinely curious now. The story Forrest had told me had intrigued me. It reminded me of certain events that had occurred on Earth, my Earth, though nothing nearly as catastrophic as this. He disappeared during the war, Frankie said. He was last seen in Sanctuary, running down the stairs, when the antimatter bomb hit. He shrugged. The true believers still think General Matheson is down here, waiting to come back and lead everyone into glory and power. He gave a low laugh. The Iron Servants have looked, though, and they haven't seen a bit of him. I think he's dead. I think he's been dead. But some people will never believe that. I wondered if he was right when the ground started to shake. I thought an earthquake had started, but Frankie's horror seemed to suggest much more than that. The snakes, he whispered, his eyes haunted. Frankie began running down the tunnel. I stayed close on his heels as the reverberations increased in intensity and speed until I could barely keep my footing. The system of concrete tunnels and bunkers had been constructed well, however, and it didn't split apart or even crack. He took quick turns to the left and right and I wondered if he was just choosing passages at random. After a couple minutes, however, he turned to me, sweating heavily, his eyes wild and moving quickly to the left and right. The lights in the tunnel flashed, a deep red glow that strobed on and off in time with the vibrations, giving everything a bloody hue and sending creeping shadows in every direction. There are bunkers just up ahead, he said quickly. They go deeper down. It's our only chance. We have to outweigh these things. 
As if on cue, I heard a wet, slithering sound just behind us. I turned my head quickly, seeing something incomprehensible in the red emergency lights of the tunnel in the moment I looked behind me. The tunnel must have been nine or ten feet tall, and the creature took up most of it. All I could see was its monstrous face. It had a giant mouth like a lamprey's, filled with hundreds of fangs spiraling around in concentric circles. Embedded in spongy black skin, the mouth never stopped moving, the teeth moving in and out as the flesh pulsated and quivered. Even after all these years, thinking of that mouth sends chills down my spine. I saw no sign of any nose or ears on the face of the creature. The skin on its body, a shiny silver color, constantly rippled as the sleek muscles of the snake worked feverishly underneath the surface. Its eyes met mine for a brief moment as its massive body slithered around the corner, dark, slitted pupils staring down at me with reptilian coldness. It quickly blinked, the eyelids closing in from the sides rather from the top and bottom, the leathery membranes flicking closed and open in the space of a moment. Then, it rolled its eyes up into its head, showing only whites and a bloody film at the bottom, and gave off an ear-splitting hiss. I turned back around, seeing I had fallen behind Frankie. He frantically sprinted ahead, the scars and fibrotic tissue on his body not slowing him at all. The tunnel shook all around us, and I nearly tripped from the constant vibrations. The creature stopped its hissing, cutting it off suddenly. It had sounded much closer, but I dared not turn my head again. I could feel the tunnel shaking faster and faster as this behemoth closed in on us, and the entire complex gave off eerie groans as countless more filled the other corridors. I was hyperventilating and knew I couldn't keep up this pace for much longer. I would soon collapse or fall, and it would shred me apart in that strange alien mouth. No one back home would ever know what happened to me. At the last moment, Frankie pointed to the left. With an athleticism I wouldn't have thought possible from his scarred body, he lunged through the door, face first. Caught by surprise, I started to turn towards the door, but my right foot slipped. I felt it all happening in slow motion, my adrenaline spiking. I expected to feel those hundreds of teeth on me at any moment. Twisting my ankle, I pushed myself towards the door. A sharp pain ran up my right leg as my foot slid out from under me. At the same time, I jumped it. As I flew through the air, I could see the snakey, and I realized it was only inches behind me. It looked like a grotesque subway train about to run me down, its two white rolled up eyes like headlights as it gnashed its teeth constantly. I went through the threshold, feeling a pressure on my back right leg, the one that had betrayed me at the critical moment. I thought my entire foot had gotten ripped off for a second. Then I landed on the concrete floor simultaneously rolling and taking the brunt of the impact on my shoulder and looked back. My shoe was gone. I started laughing, thanking God that it had only gotten my shoe. The massive, endless body of the creature kept moving past us, its reptilian muscles working furiously as it pushed itself forwards at breakneck speeds. But we had escaped. Laughing and smiling, I jumped up, then winced when I landed on my right ankle. I looked down, seeing it was swollen, but not badly damaged. I likely wouldn't be doing any more running, however. Frankie smiled at me as I danced around like a lunatic. We're alive, holy shit, we're alive, I said. I can't believe it. You lost your shoe, he said, frowning, still breathing heavily. Well, luckily, there's clothes and stuff in some of these tunnels. They were supposed to be for the people in the city in case the enemy used the H-bombs on us, but none of them ever got a chance. By the time the antimatter bomb had finished going off, the city got filled with things like that. He pointed at the snake, whose massive body still hadn't finished passing. I wondered just how massive it was. I shuddered slightly, thinking of hundreds of those things moving around the tunnels. So where do these bunkers lead? I asked. He didn't meet my eyes. Horrible things lay at the bottom, he said. I've never gone down to the deepest level. It leads to the pit of the skull. No one who has ever gone down has come back. The pit of the skull? I asked, raising an eyebrow. Who makes these terms up? He shrugged. The iron servants used to go down and try to clear things up after the bomb, he said. Most of them died. Then the government started recruiting teenagers into the iron servants. Most of them died, but they did manage to explore the places first. They put it on TV during the collapse showing, 
This is what the Kingdom of China has done to you, and trying to rouse the population towards war. But the war was already over. We ended up giving them the H-bomb and they gave us this. He motioned around us. So what happened to the ones who didn't die? I asked. Are they still around here? Frankie didn't look comfortable with the subject. Well, he said, looking like he wanted to try to find a way around the question. Then he sighed. I guess you could say they were changed. Changed? I asked. Like what? You mean like mentally, like they had trauma? He laughed at that, doubling over. Mentally? He asked. Trauma? No, no, nothing like that. He wiped a tear from his eye. If it was something like that, who would care? Not me. We all have trauma. No, they were affected by something dark. When they came back, some of them were partially skinned alive. You could see their skulls, and they were hungry, drinking blood constantly, and ripping apart bodies with their teeth. They still had on their uniforms, most of them, but they weren't human anymore. Whatever they had seen in the pit of the skull had made them demons. And that's why no one goes down to the pit of the skull anymore. Well, not the only reason. There's more than that down there. This world sucks, I said, feeling homesick. Frankie nodded. Yeah, it does, he said, lowering his head sadly, his scarred, fibrotic shoulders slumping. But this is my home. This is all I know now. What if I could get you out of here? I asked. What if I could take you back to my world? He shook his head. No, no, I won't leave it behind. This is where my friends died, and my mother and father. I think they died here too. This is where I belong, and maybe when I die here, I'll see them all again. Maybe they will be waiting for me on the other side, and they'll say, Frankie, we missed you, welcome home. I could have left here a hundred times, but this is what I know. He sighed heavily. Well, we better get moving. The tunnels outside still shook and vibrated with the passage of the snakes. Eerie echoes of clanking steel and shaking concrete ran through the complex. Okay, so where to now? I asked. He pointed down the bunker. Red light glowed on steel walls about ten feet apart. Metal benches had been fused together in the corner. I saw a dead black screen on the other side of the bunker, probably some sort of TV screen. It had been built directly into the wall. Past the metal benches, a small slit appeared in the wall, no more than a couple feet wide. I had to turn my body to get through it. I found myself in another bunker. This one had the same setup, with metal benches and a dead TV screen. But these benches weren't empty. Through the red glare of the emergency lights, I saw two bodies sitting side by side. A young woman sat on the right, her body slumped over onto the lap of a man in a uniform. They looked like they had both shot themselves. Their bodies had started to mummify in the dry bunker air. In the man's hand, I saw a pistol still gripped tightly in his desiccated hand. Beneath the young woman's open, filmy eyes, I saw another pistol on the ground, one that she had likely dropped after the final moment. It took me by surprise for a long moment, but Frankie just shot them a quick glance and kept walking. Wait, I said. They have guns. Frankie looked back at me. Guns are dangerous, he said. I don't use guns. I have no idea how you've survived so long here without a gun, I said. He looked at me for a long moment, then pointed to the corpses. They've got shoes too, he said. Why don't you see if it's your size? I limped over to the man's corpse, hesitating for a long moment. Then I pried his mummified hand open. It had a texture like leather. I could hear the bones cracking underneath as I moved the fingers, a feeling of revulsion overtaking me. I yanked the gun out of his hand as a smell like cinnamon and rotten eggs emanated from the disturbed corpse. I cracked open the massive cylinder and noticed it still had eight shots left. It was a beautiful revolver with a polished wooden handle and silver etching curving down its sides. I saw initials engraved onto the wood saying TH in calligraphy. Only one bullet was missing. I took Frankie's advice and compared the man's shoes to my one remaining shoe putting them side by side. They were slightly bigger than I would have liked, but in the circumstances, I was grateful. 
I took the shoes off of the corpse, switching my one remaining sneaker for the black leather pair the man had worn. I felt a sense of revulsion stealing from a corpse, but I knew I would need these things much more than he would. And the shoes ended up fitting surprisingly well. I gave Frankie a thumbs up. He smiled, then looked warily at the gun. He seemed to have an innate fear of guns. I moved through the slim door of the bunker, finding a corridor with ventilated metal flooring that I could look right through into the seemingly endless abyss below. At the end of the catwalk, a series of metal stairs spiraled down into the darkness. Frankie turned to me, a serious expression on his face. Friend, I should tell you the truth, he said stoically. I've never been to this part of the bunkers before. I shrugged. That's fine, as long as you know where we're going, I said. He didn't meet my gaze. You do know where we're going, right? The snakes won't stop going through the tunnels for days once they come up, he said, changing the subject, still not meeting my gaze. So you don't know where we're going, I asked. He shook his head quickly. I know the direction, he said, but I've never been down here before. These tunnels have become stranger over time. Sometimes it seems like new tunnels just appear off of ones I've passed a thousand times. Other times they seem to move around and change places. The antimatter bomb has made everything in this world strange, and these tunnels are part of it. I trust you, I said, putting my hand on his shoulder. He looked up and smiled. And anyways, I had no other choice. If Frankie couldn't find his way, I would have absolutely no chance. We began climbing down the diamond-plated steel staircase. The stairs seemed to go on for eternity. I looked down, realizing I could see right through the vents in each step. My stomach seemed to drop. I saw one red emergency light after another descending into the shaft, but no sign of a bottom. They seemed to just draw closer and closer together until they disappeared into the darkness. Frankie didn't know how far down the stairs went, and he seemed somewhat anxious as well. I tried talking to break the tension, but my voice echoed up and down through the shaft with every word, and I began to feel the noise might wake up something. I quickly stopped trying to make conversation. After what must have been an hour of descending, the air started to change all around us. It grew warmer, and a red glow began to emanate from far down below us. It looked like fire, giving off flickering hues of crimson orange and yellow. Then Frankie gave a shout of triumph, pointing. A dozen stories below us, I saw a catwalk extending from the staircase, fused to the far wall. A dark doorway stood there, the only break visible in the endless metal wall. You found a way out, I said excitedly. Where does it lead? He stopped celebrating suddenly and gave me a half smile. We'll see when we get there, won't we? When we got there, we found a heavy bunker door. I turned the wheel, which looked like one from a submarine door. It silently slid open. Behind it, I saw white lights shining from the corridors. After being in the dark with only red emergency lights for so long, it felt like staring into the sun. I squinted, blinking fast, spots dancing across my eyes. They quickly adjusted to the fluorescent lights illuminating the hallway, however. Underneath the glaring light, I saw dozens of bodies, a macabre show to welcome us to this new part of hell. They were mostly women and children, and they looked like they had tried to flee towards the door we just came through. Their bodies all faced towards the door, some of them still reaching out their pale, bloody hands towards it. Many had their throats ripped out, as if by packs of coyotes, while others had portions of their stomachs and chests chewed open, revealing the organs and intestines underneath. Puddles of blood saturated the floor, and black clouds of flies zipped around the hallway, feasting on the corpses. These bodies looked much fresher than the ones in the bunker. Uh, Frankie, I said. Just ignore them, he said after a long pause at the doorway. There's a lot more bodies here than that. Bodies won't hurt us. But what did this? I asked. Who did this? If you're lucky, he responded, you won't ever find out. As if in response to his words, the lights flickered and a deep distorted laugh began to echo from farther down the hallway. The lights came back on and I saw dozens of men beginning to approach, turning the corner, walking calmly towards us. 
It looked like some had been skinned alive, at least from the neck up. Their skulls grinned at us, a mass of blood and gore. Their lidless eyes stared ahead without blinking, and a green light seemed to spiral out from their pupils. When the lights went out again, I could still see that sickly green light in the air, emanating from the eyes of each of the transformed men. Their uniforms reminded me of the uniforms of the SS pure black jackets and pants, with high polished leather boots and a leather visor cap. On their uniforms and caps, a symbol was engraved, over and over, like a backward seven with a line slashing diagonally through it. Many also had medals pinned to their chest, medals engraved with swords and hawks and ivy vines that meant nothing to me. Frankie had turned around so fast that he ran right into me, sending me sprawling. His panicked eyes rolled in his head, and with immense strength, he sent out one hand and picked me up as he ran past me, putting me back on my feet. The suddenness of it nearly sent me falling again, but he pulled me by my hand, and I started moving. My ankle gave off waves of pain as I ran behind him. The lights went out again as we reached the door. Luckily, we had left it open. As soon as we were back out on the stairs, I flung the door closed and spun the wheel, locking the abominations inside with the bodies of their victims. A few seconds later, fists began to pound against the other side, rhythmically smashing against the metal. Frankie turned to me and shook his head. The Iron Servants, he said. The bodyguards of General Matheson. Those are the transformed ones. I'm not even sure if there's any normal ones left. I haven't seen any sign of them in months. The surviving Iron Servants used to try to do patrols still, as if they had some control over the city, but they gave that up quickly when most of them didn't return after the first night. So what now? I asked, feeling panicked. We can't go back up, and that corridor is cut off by those things. Well, we have to go down, he said. Let's hope there's another way out before we reach the pit at the bottom. Is there a way back through the pit of the skull? I asked. He nodded. It connects with everything, he said. The pit has many trails that seem to grow overnight. I've woken up in my room and found doorways that had grown there while I was sleeping. But the pit of the skull is worse than any other part of the city. I'd rather deal with the snakes than the creatures down in the pit. Have you ever been there? I asked. He hesitated for a long moment. I've looked in, he said, his face turning pale. Once. I never did it again. When I asked him why, what he had seen, he wouldn't answer, but just shook his head. With the conversation over, we began to descend, hoping to find some way out of here, but hope faded with every downward step we took. I kept looking down the shaft, expecting to see an end to the spiraling metal staircase, seeing an endless drop into an abyss whose lights faded to a pinpoint made my stomach drop every time, especially as we could see straight through the ventilated steel of the stairs. How far down does this go? I asked Frankie, incredulous. I thought of diamond mines I had heard of that went down over a mile, and I figured we must be close to that by now. The staircase had braces attached to the wall every 20 feet, an endless procession of beams that must have been instrumental in keeping them from collapsing under their own weight. I saw no more catwalks, no doors branching off the stairs. Finally, after traveling down another 20 minutes, I looked down and saw an end to the descent. I saw the hard, rocky ground of a cave floor far beneath me, illuminated with bright fluorescent lights. The beams shone upwards through the shaft, clouds of dust and dirt moving in rhythmic waves through the arrows of white light. I saw a massive sign and benches. It looked like a subway station far below us, with shining steel trash cans and an empty reception desk. What is this place? I asked, but Frankie didn't know. I've never been down this far, but I've always found my way in the past. Don't worry. If anyone can find his way in the city, it's Frankie, he exclaimed proudly. Above us, in gold-plated letters a foot tall, read, Antonine Dollarhide Transhumanist Center. Behind us, a huge black screen spanned the length of the wall, 20 feet wide and 10 feet tall. As soon as we stepped off the last of the stairs, the screen lit up. It looked like some sort of news broadcast, or perhaps a historical documentary. Looking back at the stairs, I saw some tiny red laser facing sideways on the last step likely some sort of motion detection technology 
that controlled the TV. In front of my eyes, in crisp HD definition, tens of thousands of men goose-stepped in formation in their black uniforms. A tall man with cold blue eyes in a snow-white suit with a white visor cap and tall black leather boots stood above them, simultaneously saluting and surveying them as they walked past, his expression grave and confident. His face looked like it had been carved from marble, his high cheekbones and strong chin, reminding me somewhat of the statue of David done by Michelangelo. The democratic experiment started 50 years ago in Victoria. A woman's voice read out as military processions continued to show on the screen. Fighter jets screeched above cities in tight formations, like eagles surveying their prey far below. After that, it changed to an image of cheering mobs, tens of thousands of fanatical, glassy-eyed people thronging around the man in white, stretching out their arms towards him and mobbing each other in the process. A line of soldiers in black uniforms held the crowd back from the stage where General Matheson stood, alone and unsmiling. And what were the results? For our people, hyperinflation, starvation, and economic destruction. As long as we were democratic, the global elites and profiteers would pretend to come to our aid. Yet in reality, a plan devised long ago had begun. A plan to exterminate our people from the face of the earth by underhanded means. A global conspiracy to kill off the culture creators and the great minds of Victoriat. As long as the enemy had political power, the ultimate death of our people became a certainty. The screen abruptly shifted from its focus on the mobs and military processions to show emaciated beggars in the streets, their sunken faces looking out at the camera with hopeless expressions. They wore torn, dirty clothes, and some of them had bags wrapped around their feet instead of shoes. Among them I saw children, no older than six or seven, their filthy coats and dirt-streaked faces staring towards the camera with hopeless eyes. Seeing the desperation of our dying people, our leader, General Matheson, took upon himself the salvation of our nation. The national revolution had begun, and in time, the screen changed from the charismatic movements of the leader in white on a massive stage into a blur of static and colors. The woman's voice became robotic and stretched out. In time, in team. And then the screen went totally black. I had the feeling of eyes on my back. I turned to Frankie who looked as white as a sheet, his eyes wide and horrified. But he wasn't looking at the TV. He looked behind us at the spiraling staircase, trembling and staring blankly around. Green light began to stream down the stairs, the same sickly green light I had seen coming from the eyes of the soldiers, the ones whose faces had been ripped off in some grisly experiment I couldn't imagine. I knew seeing that light couldn't mean anything good. And then the TV came back on, starting over at the beginning of the same segment, the woman's voice sounding far too loud, blaring out her strange propaganda. The voice echoed eerily in the great silent chamber, waves of sound overlapping and fading, turning into a nearly incomprehensible mishmash of sounds. The democratic experiment, she parroted behind us as Frankie grabbed me by the arm and drew me forwards. I felt like since I had first crashed the car, this city had been trying to kill me at every turn. I couldn't imagine how anyone could survive in the long term in such conditions. My respect for Frankie grew immensely at that moment as I realized he had dealt with this for years, until the point it became all he knew. We ran into the Transhumanist Center. Everything looked sparkling new, the metal still shining a bright silver, and the bright red and black walls still undamaged. At every corner, I saw the symbol that the soldiers had been wearing, the backward seven with a line slashing diagonally through it. I looked back at the immense chamber with the stairway, seeing more of those faceless soldiers descending, where they had come from, I didn't know. I felt we had securely locked the door to the hallway, but there may have been countless more on the surface and roaming the tunnels and bunkers for all I knew. They walked silently in a soldierly fashion, their backs straight and their heads held high, but the skin on their faces had been peeled away. There were hundreds of them now, a column stretching upwards on the spiraling stairs in their pressed, dark suits, like a line of black ants marching back to the colony. I turned away, Horrified, a deep sense of dread filling every part of my mind. 
The green light that seeped from the column made me feel sick and dizzy, and even looking at it for a few moments had felt like it physically weakened me in some subtle way. The hallway had labeled rooms stretching off as far as the eye could see. It almost looked like an optical illusion, with the doors being perfectly symmetrical on both sides of the corridor. The rooms were labeled in a straightforward way, with the first on the right having a large black one painted over the bright red walls. A smell like medicine and chemicals seemed to saturate the air. As Frankie moved quickly away from the threat behind us, I tried to jog next to him, but my ankle still screamed with hot pain when I tried to move too fast. I knew I couldn't keep up with him in this state. Frankie, I whispered furiously at him. He turned his head back to look at me. I pointed at my ankle and grimaced. I can't keep running. Then we'd better find a place to hide, he said, looking back. The first of the soldiers had reached the bottom of the stairwell. We were running out of time. I looked to my left and saw a random door with the number 372 painted over its top. I felt the cold metal of the handle as it turned and opened. Based on what I had seen in this place, I expected a den of horrors beyond. Perhaps dead bodies or human experimentation victims, or maybe more faceless soldiers. With relief, I saw the entire room filled with laboratory equipment, totally empty of life. Everything still looked brand new without any dust or grime covering the shining steel of the machinery. That same bright red paint covered the surface of the floor, ceiling, and walls. Frankie came quickly through behind me, quietly shutting the door. He looked for any sort of lock, but it had none. Damn, I said, a rising sense of anxiety making me feel like a trapped animal. No lock. Should we barricade the door? But it was too late. I heard the rhythmic clicking of heels against the floor outside. I turned to hide. Seeing Frankie was already gone, disappeared among the huge steel vats and chemical equipment. I frantically ran to the corner, looking for something to crawl under in case they came in. In my hurry, I knocked over a glass cylinder and in that moment sealed my own fate. I saw it falling in slow motion, my adrenaline kicking in, but my body couldn't move fast enough to catch it. My hand went out, as if with a mind of its own, trying to grab the cylinder in midair, but it slipped through my fingers. A moment later it crashed loudly against the floor. I was breathing hard, staring in shock at the shards of glittering glass littering the floor. Even though this happened a couple years ago, the sense of shock and horror at seeing that cylinder fall still stays with me as one of the worst moments of my life. And it would lead to a hellish experience worse than anything I had yet encountered in this dead city. After a few seconds, I realized that the heels had stopped clicking outside. A few seconds later, the door flew open, and I felt, in my heart, that my life was over. They saw me standing there in the middle of the room like a deer in the headlights. I turned to run. I started screaming. God no, stay away from me! I yelled. Don't fucking touch me! The faceless men grabbed me, dozens of them streaming into the room their skulls glistening under the bright fluorescent lights. After a moment, the sickening green light seemed to flow into the room with them, like thunder following lightning. Please, I said, struggling hard. Their iron grip had no yield, and they frog-marched me out, my arms pulled upwards behind my back, forcing me into a bent position. Don't kill me, I'm not even from here. They said nothing, simply herding me into the hallway. A smell of ozone permeated the area around the men, mixing with the odor of chemicals to form a truly foul scent. Standing before me, I saw General Matheson. I would have recognized him anywhere. He didn't look like the others, and they still clearly regarded him as their leader. As soon as I found myself in front of him, the soldiers released their hold on me. General Matheson's whole body gave off that sickly light, but his face was intact. His skin seemed to have changed looking like white marble. Green light streamed from every inch of his body, but his cold blue eyes were the worst. The whites radiated it, and it seemed to stream forwards from his pupils like rushing water. Just looking at him made me feel sick and weak, as if the light were itself, in some way, poisonous. He still had on his pure white soldier's uniform, a black and white visor cap with the symbol of the backward seven with a line slashing through it. In his belt, I saw a revolver, similar to the one I had stolen, and now had hidden in my pants. The revolver. I had nearly forgotten about it during the terrifying ordeal of escaping from the city. 
I looked back, expecting to see Frankie being frog-marched out of the room behind me, but there was no sign of him. The last of the soldiers left the room and closed the door. They stood all around me, forming a circle. General Matheson and I occupied the center, two very different men in the middle of countless faceless monsters. What is your name, son? General Matheson asked me politely, his face stoic and expressionless. I'm Jason, I said. And do you know who I am? He asked. I nodded, feeling unreal. The eyes of the soldiers bored into me, each waiting for a signal from their leader. That's good, he said, looking away. He appeared totally comfortable, at peace. He had the look of a true fanatic without morals or doubts, and even in his polite conversation, his face seemed to radiate that lunatic self-confidence. Please, sir, I began pleading. I'm not from this world. I came here because I was kidnapped by some madman, some strange mutated guy who brought me here. I don't belong here, I really don't. General Matheson stopped speaking for a long moment. The entire hallway plunged into silence. He contemplated his words carefully, and for a moment, I could see the great statesman he must have been before his conversion into whatever he was now. He certainly was not a regular human in his current state, no more than for us or the soldiers. We don't always have a choice where we find ourselves, he responded. When I was prime minister, the leader of a superpower with the greatest military ever seen, I heard many of the same objections from others, such as when my hometown was carpet-bombed by the Kingdom of China, and I went to the ruins. The survivors asked me why this had happened, why their little city was chosen for such a horrifying scene. I knew it had been chosen because my friends and distant family still lived there. But what could I say? Sometimes Providence puts us in horrible situations so we can grow, so we can harden ourselves and form an iron will. Then we can overcome all obstacles. The struggle itself creates greatness in men. Those who do not struggle in this world can never achieve anything great. This is the eternal law. All those who do not wish to fight forfeit their right to life. In this world, natural selection is the only truth. But I'll tell you truthfully, when I used to sleep, I had constant nightmares of my hometown. I saw the burnt bodies of children on the sidewalks next to collapsed, blackened ruins of apartment buildings, the children still sticking their arms up towards the sky, as if hoping someone would pull them out of the fire. The odor of smoke and charred wood was so thick that I could smell it before I ever got into the place, from a half mile away with the windows open. In my nightmares, I always found myself with the people I knew, the ones who had died and whose children had burnt alive. We were in the basement of some building, trying to keep the raging fire away, trying to duck down low to avoid the thick black clouds of smoke that billowed through. I remember choking, suffocating, falling over burnt bodies, and then I woke up. This went on day after day, and it reinforced the truth I had known forever, that there are no accidents in the world. I was being shown this so I could further harden myself against the future death and destruction that would surely come. Providence brought you here to us, and Providence chose that city for destruction. Providence chose Rusty Township for the antimatter bomb as well. Everything happens for a reason so that a new world can arise, like the phoenix from its own ashes. I will always follow the will of Providence, even to the end of my life." He stopped, looking me up and down, then turned and began to walk away. The soldiers flowed around him as he moved through the crowd, like a single mind, opening up a gap and then closing it as soon as he had passed. As he reached the last of the soldiers, he turned. "'Take him to the pit of the skull he said, disappearing as the soldiers closed in around me, grabbing me. They marched me down the hall for what felt like hours. Even in that moment of desperation, knowing I would soon be dead or worse, I felt a sense of awe at what these people had accomplished. I had never seen anything like this in my world. This single hallway stretched for miles and had thousands of rooms branching off both sides. My ankle still pained me, but every time I would slow, a soldier would silently push me forwards. I fell twice, landing painfully on my hands and knees, but they would pull me back up and continue to march me forwards. 
They never seemed to talk, though perhaps that was just an act. I didn't know whether they were capable of speech or whether they were simply mindless drones, following the will of General Matheson or whatever had possessed his body and mind. The hallway started to transform after a while, and I realized I could see the end of it. A deep, lava-filled crater bubbled far ahead of us. Beyond that, the walls and rooms disappeared into a rocky, cave-like chamber. The orderly, symmetrical construction of the hall ended in torn wood, shattered doors, and melted metal when it reached the end. That same sickly light flowed out through the cavern, much stronger and brighter as we continued forwards. I saw stalagmites and stalactites through the light, like teeth in a rotten green mouth, a mouth that would soon swallow me whole. At the front of the transition from hallway to cavern stood General Matheson, grinning now. As soon as he saw me, he came forward. The pit of the skull, he said. This is where the magic happens. He paused for a long moment, looking thoughtful. You know, I used to be a transhumanist, thinking we could change ourselves into higher beings with genetic engineering and computer chips. He sighed at this, his grin fading. What a fool I was. The true transhumanism is here in this chamber with us, and it is a far more monumental discovery towards the evolution of humanity than any implanted microchip. He made a sweeping motion with his hand. Here, we have the cure for death itself. This is where the new world will begin, and you will join me in the struggle. You will become one of my soldiers. With my mouth dry and my heart pounding, they pushed forward into the pit of the skull, where my humanity would be drained from me and replaced with something unthinkable. Tears began to flow down my cheeks as I thought of my family back home and thought of all the things I wanted to do in my life. I felt in my heart I would never escape this place. As we crossed the threshold from the hallway into the cave, I saw a strange mixture of architecture. There were patches of cave extending into the end of the hallway, and remnants of twisted metal, and small areas of bright red paint still stuck to areas of the cavern wall. It looked like the cave had grown organically into the hall and fused with it. I had no idea how this could have happened naturally, but I figured the antimatter bomb had changed this world so drastically that now even the Earth itself might act in unnatural and bizarre ways. Most of the soldiers had scattered into various places when we had entered the pit of the skull. Only two now stood guarding me, one holding each arm and forcing me forwards into the sick green light that emanated from the cave, twisting my stomach and making my head pound. I felt my mouth go dry and my heart race. Goosebumps rose on my skin and I felt myself beginning to tremble uncontrollably my teeth chattering. My hands reminded me of the tremors of an earthquake. General Matheson had gone, receding deeper into the pit of the skull. I wondered if I would see him again. I knew that, if I was transformed, he would become like a god to me. I would become just another mindless soldier in his vast army of abominations. As we went deeper into the cave, I saw that the green light seemed to emanate from the walls, floor and ceiling of the cave itself. They came in rhythmic waves, strengthening and fading, giving everything a diseased look. The fused, half-cavernous setting continued to spread before me as I saw barracks, rooms, and large halls. I looked over at the first one I passed and saw a massive mess hall. A murmuring susurration seemed to hiss from the mess hall where hundreds of soldiers in black uniforms sat down to eat. I looked over for a moment as I was dragged past my ankles shrieking in pain as the soldiers kept pressing me on farther towards my doom. With horror, I saw that the faceless transformed soldiers ate human body parts, raw and sliced up, each on a tin plate. I could see parts of legs and arms, faces with the cheeks and tongues missing, and much more evidence of this brutal and sickening mass cannibalism. From behind a serving window, I saw a pig-like man in a large chef's uniform, his face round and pink his nose bovine. He snorted and spat constantly as he used a large meat cleaver to slice up more bodies. I saw blood splattering the ceiling and walls behind him as the cleaver thwacked down again and again, splintering bone and slicing through flesh like butter. I felt like I'd entered into the ninth circle of hell itself. How could anyone live in such a place? Who would want to cling to life in such a destroyed world? 
or in such a ruined and dead city as this one. But even as I looked in with absolute terror, I noticed that they could talk. They all seemed to talk at the same time, murmuring in low voices, their skeletal mouths moving up and down, the muscles underneath flexing and contracting. But it didn't sound like words by the time it reached me, but more like the hissing of a snake, combined with the rhythmic thwack, thwack, thwack of the meat cleaver behind it all. I saw those same strange half-pig men all over the cavernous compound. Sometimes they were hauling loads of emaciated dead bodies, naked men, women and children, whose faces were all twisted into eternal expressions of terror and agony. I saw marks of torture on many of the bodies, deep gouges that cut to the bone and burn marks on their faces and eyes. They took the bodies towards the mess hall and the kitchen behind it, snorting and grunting as they passed. My faceless captors frog-marched me past this den of nightmares, twisting my arms painfully behind me, forcing me to lean forward and stride fast. I wondered if Frankie was still alive, whether he too would be taken here and see the true nature of the pit of the skull. Then the corridor opened up into a massive chamber, with stalagmites and stalactites thirty feet long appearing up and down, sharp as spikes and thin as pencils. The walls seemed to shiver and vibrate as curtains of green light passed through, emanating from the floor and ceiling, swirling and moving in cyclonic waves. I saw cages stacked on the sides of the walls, cages filled with naked, starving people. Some of them cried and wailed when they saw me, holding out their thin, skeletal arms, like a child asking for its mother. Many of the others moaned in their cages, their eyes rolling, the sores on their bodies often infected and leaking. Large areas of discolored purplish bruises shone on many of the victims, and I even saw leg bones and arm bones poking out through the skin, compound fractures that had turned necrotic and infected. Thousands of human captives lived in this place, and the green light illuminated everyone and shone light into the darkest of corners. The smell of sickness and death was overwhelming, so thick I could taste it. Behind the screams and moans of the tortured souls imprisoned here, I heard a distinct electrical humming sound, as if I were standing under high voltage power lines. I could feel it rattle my bones and vibrate my chest. It was a powerful feeling, and it grew stronger as I went deeper into the chamber, past the last of the cages. The smell of ozone as we got further in became overwhelming, faint odors of sulfur and mold mixed with it. My senses began to feel overwhelmed, and I wasn't even at the worst of it yet. In the middle of the chamber I saw stone tables covered with blood. Some of it had long ago dried and darkened, but much of it looked fresh and wet, bright red pools that dripped from the sacrificial spot. It reminded me of an Aztec sacrificial altar. General Matheson stood next to one of the tables, holding a serrated, wicked-looking knife. Its blade looked made out of obsidian, a thin black blade with a glassy sheen curving out of a bone handle carved into the shape of a skull. He grinned when he saw me, his white marble face pulsating with an aura of that same green light. It seemed to embrace him, surround him, and emanate from every pore as I drew nearer. The two faceless soldiers strapped me down on the table, putting a leather belt around my arms and legs and a gag in my mouth. Then General Matheson slowly began to lower the blade down towards my face. This is going to hurt a lot, he said laughing. But that's part of the becoming. All great men have had great suffering. This is an eternal law. I closed my eyes tightly, waiting for the blade to make contact, to begin skinning me alive, to rip off my face and then begin the transformation into a monstrous soldier who would eat raw human meat and carry out atrocities without a second thought or any sense of emotion. What do you think you're doing? A voice hissed from the edge of the chamber. My eyes flew open and my head turned. I saw Foraz standing there, his bleached white skin given a green hue by the supernatural light of the chamber. What business is it of yours, High Priest Foras? General Matheson asked coldly. I brought this one here to this world, he screamed his voice sounding inhuman and amplified as it echoed through the vast cavern. This is my soul for the taking, not yours. General Matheson looked down at me, his eyes blazing with fury. Is this true? He asked me. Did this man bring you here? 
He is no man, I whispered, still terrified, still expecting the cutting pain of the blade at any second. But yes, he brought me here, that is true. He kidnapped me, and I escaped him. I thought he planned to kill me. Regardless, this is my sector and it is staffed with my troops. I must demand you leave at once, Forrest. Do not make me angry. My troops will come at a moment's notice and I will have you executed if you interfere with me. My business is state business, and I am the leader, my will is absolute. You have been swallowing your own bullshit for too long, Forrest said, laughing. If you try to attack me, I will kill you and all your troops. I don't need to mutilate bodies to get my power, General Matheson. I am not so weak as that. General Matheson's eyes widened in surprise at the insult. Guards, kill him, he shrieked. Kill him now, I want his head brought to me on a platter. Soldiers in black uniforms rushed in, their bloody skulls grinning under their visor caps. Many had guns, and others had flamethrowers and rocket launchers. They showed no fear but instead ran straight at Forrest. I watched in surprise as Forrest calmly surveyed the dozens of men rushing in his direction, intending to kill him. He pulled out a black stone from his pocket. I recognized it immediately. It was the stone he had used to suck out the soul of the mutant boy we had encountered in the city. The stone he had used to follow me here. He threw it in a bored, underhanded way, not rushing or panicking, not showing a hint of emotion. He spoke a few guttural words in some strange language I had never heard before as the stone flew across the cavern, and suddenly it burst into a blinding white light. It almost hurt to look at it, but I kept watching, mesmerized by the surreal scene taking place before me. The soldiers had begun firing their weapons, and bullets raked the walls and floor. General Matheson cursed and began running out of the chamber towards a large metal door built into the wall at the far side. A rocket launcher went off, and an explosion of heat blossomed only 40 feet away. Yet I ignored the mayhem and watched Forrest, knowing I could do nothing to save myself if a stray bullet came in my direction anyways. The light began to expand from a pinpoint to a line about 10 feet across. It looked like a tropical sun shone out of the rip in space that now appeared across the chamber. Strange tentacles reached out, groping blindly. They were a sickly dark shade of purple with black razor-sharp spikes sticking out of the front, like the legs of a poisonous spider. The spikes clicked closed and open in fast rhythmic waves. The tentacles kept coming, 10 feet, then 20, then they were wrapping around the soldiers and squeezing hard. I saw the spikes bite into their skin and begin to drain the blood from their bodies, prodding and sucking as the soldiers' skeletal mouths opened in silent screams. Dozens of the tentacles flicked out, and soon Forrest stood alone among the alien appendages reaching out from another dimension, looking at his handiwork and smiling. He seemed to have totally forgotten about me. More soldiers were streaming in by the second, firing guns and rocket launchers and flinging grenades, but the tentacles would wrap around them and drain all the blood from their bodies in mere seconds. The cacophony of explosions and the heat and the light made me flinch and turn away and I trembled uncontrollably, feeling I would die at any second. I heard a soft whisper from right behind me. I nearly jumped out of my skin. Turning my head, I saw Frankie crouch there, holding a very sharp silver dagger. We have to get you out of here, he said, cutting at the leather bindings holding me to the table. I know where we are now. The hallway that leads out of here intersects with Veridan. I've never come down this far before and now I think you know why. In a few moments he had freed me. I quickly jumped down from the table and followed him, looking back to see Forrest throwing another black ball into the air as hundreds of soldiers ran in from the mess hall and surrounding barracks. Countless bodies littered the floor and I saw at least 30 tentacles now reaching out, some of them stretching up to the ceiling or hundreds of feet down the hall. Shuddering, I followed Frankie. We passed room after room where half-pig men sliced up bodies, hanging them from the ceilings like a hunter prepping a deer. I saw human skins lined up, discarded in corners, flat and stacked one on top of another. I smelled roasting meat, and the delicious scent of herbs and spices floated out of the rooms. After running for twenty minutes without any trouble, I saw with fear that a group of the pigmen now moved down the hall, 
armed with tall axes and massive blood-stained meat cleavers. They snorted and began shouting when they saw me and Frankie. Frankie stopped, pulling out a silver dagger from inside his tattered clothes. He turned to me. You ready to fight? He said, a gleam in his eyes. He gave me a grim smile, his scarred face twisting as the excitement of battle and the rising bloodlust took hold. I knew, because I had the same rising feeling in my chest. Stop, the pigmen cried. Surrender, or we'll slice you into pieces and feed you to the dogs. I reached for the revolver in my pocket, whipping it out. I knew I only had eight bullets. I counted the pigmen, a wave of adrenaline coursing through my body. Everything seemed slowed down, my reflexes much faster. In a moment, my mind told me, 10. Well, that's not good, I thought to myself. I began firing, aiming for the head or heart. The pigmen rushed me, waving their weapons, a fanatical gleam in their small, squinting eyes. Their round faces were flushed and sweating, and even from here I could smell the body odor that surrounded them, like flies surrounding a carcass. The first one's head exploded in a mist of blood and bone splinters. He still ran for a few steps, his headless body following some random nerve impulses that still fired in his destroyed nervous system. Then his body collapsed, sliding forward, the meat cleaver sliding out from his opening hand. The second one I hit in the chest, he grabbed at his heart, his eyes widening as he fell to the side, tripping another one who went sprawling, his large axe flying across the rocky floor. They kept coming, and I kept shooting. I killed seven and wounded another one, who was dragging himself across the floor with a massive hole in his leg, a flood of blood coming out in time with his heartbeat. Then I heard the click of the empty chamber. The last two pigmen were now within a few feet of Frankie and me. With a roar, Frankie rushed forward. They swung their meat cleavers at his face and neck, but he ducked, slicing one across the abdomen. I saw his intestines and organs spill out in a waterfall of gore. In the same swiping move, Frankie raised the knife, expertly slicing the other across the neck. They both fell back, the latter choking on his own blood and writhing, kicking his feet and clenching his fists as he raised them in the air. Come on, Frankie said, and we kept running. The end of the hallway was in sight now, and I was grateful. We have to get out of the undergraves before the drums start. What drums? I asked. He just shook his head. You're almost home, friend, he said. The door to your world is right up ahead. Many others have come through there too. Most don't return through there. Most of them die. But I try to help those I find. I try to help my friends. How did you even get to me? I asked. I hid and they didn't find me. I crawled under some machine in the corner. They took you out. I waited, and then I saw that really white man creeping down the hall, and I followed. Something in me told me he meant trouble. Then I just snuck in and did what I did. He shrugged, as if it were no big deal that he had saved my life, or maybe even saved me from a fate even worse than death. At the end of the hall, I saw a wooden door with a blue daisy painted on it. It stood before me, chipped and old. I opened it finding a huge stone stairwell rising up. It seemed to go on forever. I turned and hugged Frankie. Thank you, I said with tears in my eyes. You didn't have to help me, and you did. Why don't you come with me? You don't have to live in such a nightmarish hellscape as this. He just shook his head. I belong here, where my family lived and where they died, he said. I turned and closed the door ascending the stairs for hours before I came to a shed. I found myself locked in. I stood at the door, knocking and yelling for hours before an old man came with a key and let me out. He didn't look surprised to see me or the endless stairs in his shed, but I think that's another story. I ended up finding myself over a thousand miles away from where I first started on my way home from work. I had a tough time trying to explain to my family how I teleported that distance in a single night. I still have nightmares about that world, about that dead city, and sometimes I wonder if Forrest will come back for me. I can only hope he died in the battle with the undead soldiers, but late at night, when I'm falling asleep, I still see his face and I wonder.